Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well. My printer decided to grab a bunch of blank sheets of paper and just send them along with the copies of my slides. And I just recognized that. Of course, I guess when I turn over those slides, I can just be quiet. How's that? It's very good to see everyone here, and I hope that you all are doing well. Uh, we are continuing our survey through the uh, books of the Bible on our Sunday nights as a part of our theme um, from Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so we're uh, re-familiarizing ourselves perhaps with some of the books that are not as familiar and becoming even more familiar with those that are. Very glad that you are here tonight. Would you pray with me as we begin tonight? Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for your love, and thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. We ask that you go with us during this time of study tonight, that you would uh, bless us, Father, to help us to understand and to know your will better. We're th so thankful for the time you've given us, and ask your blessings to be upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we're going to begin looking into the Minor Prophets. And uh, contrary to popular opinion, the minor prophets were not underaged prophets. Three people got that. The rest of you are probably just tired of my jokes. I don't know. It is late in the day. Uh, nor did they work uh, digging rocks. Just, just making sure everybody's awake. So your neck's going to hurt if you keep shaking it like that. So... Um, the, the minor prophets are not minor because of lack of significance or importance. They are simply called the minor prophets because of the length of their books, not the importance of those books, not anything to do with the content. Uh, their content is equally important with Isaiah and Jeremiah, just not quite as lengthy. And they uh, prophesied during very specific periods of time, either to... Uh, uh, Israel to Judah, or in some cases they were covering uh, a little bit of both territory. Now, tonight we're going to look at uh, Hosea. I had um, a person tell me one time, uh, where's Hugh? Here's five more cents for the building fund. All right. Looks like it, it got knocked out of there. Um yeah, they, we just missed it. And there's no telling what we can pay for with that five cents, right? Oh, okay, you threw it and missed it. Uh, but he said, you know, it's, it's not Hosea, it should be Hosea, uh, because it's not a Mexican prophet. And he, he was trying to be funny, but he also thought he was correct. But actually, Hose, Hosea is the correct, correct pronunciation, because our Old Testament books get their name from the Greek. And the uh, A sound there is the Ada, and so it's Hosea. And so that is the correct, correct pronunciation. Hosea, we don't know very much about this man at all. Uh, we know what we find in the uh, opening chapter regarding uh, his father and where he was from. And we know that he was told to take a wife and have children. But we know nothing else about him. There's nothing about him referred to in the other Old Testament books nor in the New Testament books. So he, he comes to us on the scene at a particular time, and he is gone just as quickly as he appears. But the mark that he leaves on the Scripture is invaluable. Uh, God had him uh, at a very specific point in time for a very specific reason. Uh, the book is thought to be autobiographical, that the prophet himself recorded these things. Uh, Hosea uh, prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II in the northern tribes of Israel. And it is thought to be around uh, 30 or so years prior to Assyria coming in and taking over uh, and removing uh, the people from the northern tribes. The purpose in, uh, in the book of Hosea is to reveal God's unconditional love, especially when contrasted with the sinful spiritual adultery of his people. 
Even in the midst of a horrible time and rebellion, God still loves his people and is calling them to repentance. Uh, that's, that's very special for us in the Christian age uh, because, you know, we often uh, suffer from uh, spiritual self-esteem issues. And we wonder if, uh, you know, if God could really love me after I've done this or after I've done that. And uh, as a Christian, you know, being a Christian is no different from being in Israel back in 755 B.C. Um, it's just not any different. We're, we're going to make mistakes. Hopefully we don't make tremendous mistakes like they did. But even under the tremendous spiritual adultery that they engaged in, God still loved them and was calling them back, wanted fellowship with them. Uh, God did not want to destroy them. He wanted to, them to be his family once again. And so it's a, it's a beautiful story. Uh, the setting for the times in which uh, Hosea was prophesying, it was a time of economic and territorial prosperity, both for Israel in the northern section and Judah in the southern section. Uh, both had expanded territories during this time. Uh, economic prosperity had brought about uh, some good things, but as with economic prosperity, oftentimes you lose track of God in that time. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, they, they were not paying attention to God. As a matter of fact, it was a time of spiritual apostasy, and they had exchanged the true and living God for Baal, the fertility God, and his consort, Asherah, and they were even engaging in temple prostitution during this time. So you can see that they had come a long way um, in a very short period of time. Also during this time, Assyria was rising to power, and within just a few years would establish itself as a world empire under Tiglath-Pileser III, and uh, in 722, 721, uh, God would send Assyria in to punish his people and remove them from the land. So we're within 30 or so years of that taking place. And so that is the setting for uh, the time of, of Ho Hosea. Uh, major themes, uh, spiritual adultery is right up there at the top. Uh, God considers himself to be married to his people. And when his people, to whom he uh, believes himself to be married, when they chase after other gods, they are, in essence, committing spiritual adultery, just as we would commit uh, physical adultery uh, with our spouses or against our spouses. Uh, the knowledge of God is a very uh, important aspect because they had forgotten God and chased after these other gods but and we'll, we'll touch on this third aspect uh, at the end of our lesson tonight but also God's frustrated love because he called out time and again to his, his espoused and she did not respond favorably to him calling out through his prophets the book breaks down into five sections uh, chapter 1 Beginning through chapter 3 and verse 5, we have Hosea's family and God's family contrasted with one another. The second, uh, excuse me. There, whoop. there we go. Uh, the second section, God uh, takes Israel to court and he is having a conversation as if they are in a courtroom. And he's bringing charges against them. Uh, Hosea's um, invitation is tarnished by the reality of not only the people but his standing we have the final arguments of God against Israel and then lastly in the final chapter we have the possibility of restoration bring bought, bring bought, being brought about I can't even speak tonight you know why it is don't you because the Johnsons have completely thrown me off they're sitting on the wrong side of the auditorium tonight they're not in their assigned seats, and so I'm, I'm not able to speak correctly. At least that, that's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. Um, yeah, amen, brother. And you know, you're the only one sitting over by the air conditioners. So uh, either nobody else is bothered by the heat, 
or they were more concerned with hearing the lesson than they were hearing the air conditioners. I don't know. And they're getting to hear my tongue get tied up in my mouth. Um, so uh, I want to bring a very short lesson from this incredible book to you tonight. And it's very pertinent to us today um, in the Lord's church. And I want to talk to you about God's deep abiding love. And if you would join me in chapter 14. As the book draws itself to a close, chapter 14, 1 through 9. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away our iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will not say any more to the hand, the work of our hands, you are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. I will hear, heal their, their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from me. I will be like the dew of Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. May God bless the reading of his word. The Old Testament prophets, especially the minor prophets, do not get a lot of consideration uh, in our preaching because of different circumstances that come about. Uh, there may or may not be something pertinent to what a particular congregation needs at that time. I don't know. But one of the beautiful things about surveying all the books of the Bible on our Sunday nights is, is I get to bring a lesson from every book in the Bible in the course of a year. And, and that's exciting for me. Um, because as Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he says, I have not ceased to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. The minor prophets are part of the whole counsel of God. Even though the particulars may not deal with us specifically today, the themes and, and a lot of the broad ideas that are found therein absolutely apply to us today. And so when we consider Hosea, he was told by God to take a wife of harlotry. He was told to go find a prostitute and marry her. And he did what God said. And he married Gomer. Let's, let's go to the first chapter, if you will, and let's look at some of the, the details of this marriage. Verse 3, he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. In a little while, it's in 30 years. And to us, you know, 30 years may sound like a lot, but when you're considering the time frame that God's working under, uh, he's trying to to give these people every opportunity to make a change. Verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, call her name Lo-Rahamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Literally, the name of this daughter is No Mercy. That's what he calls her, No Mercy. And when she had weaned, verse 8, lo, Rahamah, she conceived and bore a son. And God said, 
Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Lo Ami literally means not my people. And this is the family of Hosea. She would return to um, her practice of prostitution. Um, Gomer would continue to receive her back. And what we have here is a prophet who is a real-life parable of God and his people existing right there because he continued to welcome her back, to love her, but yet... God continued to welcome back and love his people, but they continued to return to Baal and Ashtaroth. The abiding, this deep abiding love that God has is phenomenal. But what I can't understand are those people who have misunderstood the Old Testament. And, you know, they say, well, you know, the God of, of the New Testament is a God of love, but the, uh, the God of the Old Testament is just an, an angry God. You know, there's no grace, there's no love. When you see him welcoming his people back time and again, there's a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of love that God's showing there. Uh, there's, a, there's so much grace and so much love in the Old Testament. Why did he not destroy Adam and Eve? Did he not extend grace to them? There, and there's the opening of sin coming into the world. And the first thing God does is he extends grace to them. And he shows his love and his mercy to them. They did not deserve that. You, you consider, we're born into a sinful world. Sinful parents, sinful grandparents go all the way back to uh, our common ancestors back in the distant past. Adam and Eve were created by the hand of God in a perfect place where there was no sin. And they rebelled against God by believing the serpent rather than believing God. So their circumstances were very different than ours. They had fellowship and walked in the cool of the day with God in this beautiful paradise known as Eden. And yet they did what God told them not to do. And he extended his grace to them. He showed mercy to them. But God continues to do that down through history. Uh, even during the time of the wilderness wanderings and the punishment of 40 years because they refused to take the land, God was still showing grace. He was still showing mercy. He was still showing his love to his people by providing meals for them, by not allowing their clothing to wear out. And even when they were being uh, grumbling and complaining against God and he sends the, the fiery serpents in among them, he provides them a way where the, they will not die during that time with the brass serpent on the pole. So we have a lot of things that God is doing. Now here we have a division taking place and this division is the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. After Solomon, they divided Rehoboam, Jeroboam, uh, a, a long, horrible history of God's people. But even in the midst of a horrible time, there were still people in the northern tribes who were following God. They were the exception. They were not the rule. But even in the midst of an extremely perverse, degenerate group of people, a man like Hosea could find favor in the eyes of God the prophets, and others. But they were certainly in the minority. And so when we look in chapter 15, or chapter 14, there's three things I want us to notice that God says that shows the incredible nature of his love for his people. And the first thing is, in verse 4, this idea of spiritual healing. He says, I will heal their backsliding." I will heal their backsliding. How should I say this? We do not often treat our brothers and sisters who fall away and come back perhaps as lovingly as we should. I have seen it far too many times 
when someone is caught up in a public situation and they even leave for a period of time and they come back and they ask for forgiveness, there are some people that will actually keep their distance from them. If God's willing to heal their backsliding, provide he, uh, spiritual healing for his people Israel who worship Baal and Ashtaroth, shouldn't we show the love of God to those who have returned for spiritual healing? Certainly we should. Those of us who, uh, and I would assume that's all of us, who have received spiritual healing ourselves, shouldn't we show the same favor towards those who return? And so God says, I will provide them spiritual healing. I will heal. And when God heals something, he heals it completely. He doesn't heal it partially. You look at the healing of Jesus. Uh, in our call to worship this morning, I was uh, speaking from Luke chapter 17, where uh, Jesus heals the ten lepers. He says, go show yourself to the priests, and they leave, and as they were going, they were healed. They weren't partially healed. They were completely healed. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he didn't raise part of him from the dead. And so spiritually speaking, we can't expect that God's going to just partially do the job. When we ask for forgiveness, he's not going to partially forgive us or partially heal us. He's going to completely forgive us. We've got to show that same unconditional love to our brothers and sisters. Secondly, he says that he's going to provide full salvation. He says, I will love them Freely, for my anger has turned away from me. To love them freely means he's given them a clean slate. He's provided full salvation. You know, God doesn't provide us partial salvation. He doesn't say, well, you're partly saved and, you know, maybe you're three quarters saved. We're either saved or we're not. And if we believe the words of God and the promise of God and the, the faithfulness of God through his son, Jesus Christ, and the power of his blood, we understand we're saved. That doesn't mean we can't walk away from that and lose our salvation. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we're either saved or we're not. And there's far too many times I've had conversations, and I've even had this feeling myself many years ago, uh, and you talk to somebody, are you saved? If you die today, would you go to heaven? And you know what most people say? Well, I, I hope so. You mean you don't know? Why don't you know? You're either saved or you're not. If you die saved, are you going to heaven? You are. You're not going to die saved and God go, well, I will, there's something I didn't tell you about. You know, it's not going to be that. God, God's you're saved. Why did Jesus die on that cross? So God could turn you away at the gates? Or so he could welcome you in with open arms? See, once we get to that full salvation knowledge of ourselves, how freeing is that going to be for us to live the Christian life? Instead of worrying about every little nitpicky thing along the way, thinking, oh, well, I've got to do that. Oh, I've got to do this. Yes, there are things we have to do. Yes, we've got to keep short accounts with God. Yes, we have to correct things that are wrong in our life. Yes, we understand those things. But during that process, we've got to understand we're still saved. Every time you commit a sin, you're not all of a sudden lost again. If you're a faithful Christian, you know, you're going to stumble. Was Paul lost when he played the hypocrite with the believers in Galatia? Was he lost or was he just wrong? Think about that. Now, Paul called him out for his hypocrisy of showing favoritism to the Jewish, Christ, the Jewish brothers over the Gentile brothers. He called him out on his hypocrisy, and Peter turned from that. He changed. But that doesn't mean that Peter was lost. He was just wrong. Just like we're wrong. But when the apostle John writes to us in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us of all sin. 
walking in the light that's living faithfully. That cleansing is a present and continuing action that goes on and on and on as we walk in the light. Guess what happens when we walk in the light? Verse 8. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So, as we walk in the light, even the Apostle John says we, we sin. But verse 9, this is, this is the one that we've got to pay attention to. But if we confess our sins, those of us who are walking in the light, we confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of most of our unrighteousness. It doesn't say most. Almost all of our unrighteousness. It's all. It's all. It's either all or nothing with God. Do we understand that? It's all or nothing. And so you're either saved or you're not. And if we believe the promises of God and we submit and, and call on the name of the Lord saying, I can't save myself, save me, and we are immersed in water for the remission of our sins and raised to walk in a new life, are you saved? If you're trusting in the promises of God and if God's word is true, you are absolutely saved. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to stumble sometime between that point and when the Lord returns or you die. Because but God, he took care of us. The blood of Jesus is not a one-time event. It's not just a cleansing at our baptism and, okay, good luck for the rest of your life. You know, it's an ongoing thing, but we walk in the light. And so what does, what does God say to his, his backsliding people, Israel? Number one, I want to heal you spiritually, but number two, I'm going to provide you full salvation when you come back to me. Full salvation. That's a beautiful thought, and doesn't that attest to that deep abiding love of God and how much he cares for us? Lastly, he's going to show forth his divine influence. I want you to look at verse 5. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. You know, um, there, there's a barrenness in the land, and dew refreshes the land. God himself is going to be that dew and refresh his people and refresh their land when they return to him. That's what he desires to be, and he is showing spiritual healing, full salvation, and I'm going to bring about my own influence and reverse some things that are happening. I just want you to come back. I want you to come back. Now, today, we're not always quite so good about that. And, and I understand the difficulties of sin all too well. And I think if we're honest, we, we understand these, di these great difficulties. But there's a God who loves us, who recognizes our sin, who sees it even more deeply than we ourselves could ever see it, and he loves us anyway. And he wants us to maintain a relationship with him, and if we've fallen away, he wants us to come back to him. When we turn our attention over to the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to a a church that was divided, a church of Gentiles and Jews. And they had some difficulties between them. But he's writing to them as a group. And he says, you, that's plural. That's to all the members of the church there, the Jews and the Gentiles. Beginning verse 1 of chapter 2, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now let's stop there. That's a, that's a pretty scathing indictment from God against the people and their past. We, 
we were the direct recipients and had earned that right. The direct recipients of the wrath of God. We'd put ourselves right in the path by our sins. Walking in darkness, following uh, ba- basically Satan's leading. That's that when you're living a life of sin, that's, that's what you're doing. You're following Satan's leading. I may, I've made this statement a lot, and if the Lord allows me to keep living, I'm going to keep making it until he shows me that, that I'm wrong. But I think the next two words are the two most powerful words in all the Scripture. But God. You were lost. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were the, in the direct path of the wrath of God. You were sons of disobedience. But God. Isn't that what Hosea is doing to God's people? That th- this, that's who they were in these first three verses. But who is it that's crying out to them to come back? God is. And here we see to the New Testament church at Ephesus. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The contrast here between what we were and what God always has been and continues to be there's a great gulf between those things that that you can't see from one side to the other it's so massive but the love and mercy and grace of god bridged that through his son jesus christ made it possible for us but god because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You know, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you say, I cannot save myself, and you obey that precious gospel, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, guess what? Before you go under that water, you are dead. You are spiritually dead. You are dead in your sins. But when the blood of Christ is applied to you in that watery grave of baptism, you are raised back to life, a new life, a forgiven life, a life clothed in Christ, a life where all of those past things are gone. They don't exist anymore. You're clean. Just like the lepers were uh, were cleansed completely, you are cleansed completely. By grace you have been saved. Verse 8. One of the favorite verses of many, many people. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God extended his gift to his people Israel. He, He laid that gift out there for them through the prophets over and over again. And he says, come back to me. They didn't deserve it. They had not earned it. But it, had to, it would take an act of faith on their part in the promises of God to come back where his grace could be applied to them and they could be healed spiritually. They could receive that full salvation. And they could see the divine influence of the reversal of these horrible things that have taken place. Our God is a great God. He is a loving God, and he is a God who is so rich in mercy. He has that deep abiding love, and it does not matter what you have done. It doesn't matter. He's calling you home. That's why it's called good news, people. The gospel. It's good news. 
Because your past doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the decision you make now and how you live your life going forward. That's all that matters. I don't understand it completely. I don't think any of us do. We understand it in, in bits and pieces, and we trust in things that we cannot see when we place our faith in God. But he wants us back. He wants us back. If we are faithful, that is a message we need to be sharing with our unfaithful brethren. That God wants them back. I had the um, unfortunate um, opportunity to connect um, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, with uh, a young lady that I had uh, seen in high school and taken her to, to the prom and all of these kinds of things and she had taken a very different turn through her life and uh, she had become a raging alcoholic she lost her husband she lost custody of her children she lost her career um, she was uh, a chemistry major at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and she had worked for uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals in the Research Triangle. And she had gone back and gotten a CNA and was working basically for minimum wage uh, in an assisted care facility. And I get a friend request from her on Facebook, and I asked her how she was doing, and after a while she began talking to me about these things. And I said, uh, she made some, uh, some passing mention of God. And I said, God loves you, and he can forgive you. And she said, God couldn't possibly love me for what I've done, and there's no way that he can forgive me. She had convinced herself of that. And this past November, uh, she took her own life. Her sister had not heard from her uh, for several days, and they were supposed to be getting together for Thanksgiving. And so when they couldn't reach her and she had not reported for work, they went over and she'd been deceased for a couple of days. Um, 54 years old. And God could not possibly love me and God could not forgive me. I tried. But some people have, you know, built those walls up. And, and there are a lot of people just like her including those within the church who have left the church and don't believe that there's any hope for them to come back. We, we need to be the ones to show them, hey, there is hope. There is an opportunity to come back, that God does love you, that God not only can, but he will forgive you, and he will heal you spiritually. If he would do that to Baal worshipers, those who were passing their children through the fires of Molech, those who were engaging in temple prostitution, those who had changed the priesthood, had changed the location, and changed the object of their worship through the years, and were no longer following the Lord God who had brought them out of Egyptian bondage. If he could love them enough, he can love us. And he can love those of our number who have uh, gone away from the church. Let's share this good news with them. We have good news, and let's share it. Let's be encouraging with every opportunity that we have, our God loved us enough to bring us to where we are right now. Certainly we can share that love with someone else. If you're here tonight, our brothers picked out a song uh, to encourage us. If you're here tonight and you need prayers uh, if for whether it's sin, discouragement, uh, maybe you're facing an illness, maybe there's some difficulties that you're facing in your life, or if you happen to be here and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we encourage you uh, to let us know, can we study with you? pray with you, encourage you in some way, or if you're ready tonight, the baptistry is always prepared. We can immerse you into Christ tonight. You can put him on in baptism, receive the remission of your sins so that you can begin walking in that newness of life. Whatever your need is, won't you please come as together we stand and as we sing.